discussions today are aspiring to go and study out of the country. Their desire is to be, have a better life. Their desire is to at least go and see what others are doing and be able to compete with those who feel that they are better off than us who are from Africa and so on. But then there are a lot of questions that they need to answer. There are some problems that they find as challenges that they, they didn't answer to. And that's why webinars like this are so important. So today we have two guest speakers who will be speaking on broad areas and they will be bringing it home to us so that we can have an understanding and be better equipped with the tools that are necessary for us to be able to get whatever it is we want and to be successful in life. Part of what we'll be discussing are funding opportunities, sending code, emails, for those of us who want to do our graduate school studies. Part of what it will also let us know is about our choices, our choices of school and our women at the courses we want to also learn. They also teach us about the English language test requirements. You know, there are some schools that do not require English language proficiency test. So they also let us know all these things. So I'm only asking you that you should just relax. And at the end of this session, please reach out to us, make use of the chat box, as you have been told by the moderator, your questions, write them down. And I'm pretty sure that during the question and answer session, all the guests will be able to answer them as appropriate. So I will urge you to relax and have a swell time and do contact us even after this event for your international admissions needs. Thank you. God bless you. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Kachi, for that wonderful opening remark. Um, as you've clearly heard from him, please make use of the comment section and we are also available to attend to your questions even after the um, webinar. Uh, we have our social media handles available for you to ask questions and even to go on with your uh, admission application process. So I'll be making room for INSEAD INSE to take on the keynote address. INSE, please. Hello, Inse. Okay, so while we're waiting for Inse, um, I would like us to remember that this program is being sponsored by Study Globally Nigeria, your pathway to success. Study Globally is in charge of admission processes for people who want to study outside of Nigeria. We also have platforms where we have um, adult information people for scholarship opportunities for different countries as well as different programs um, for you to be part of that premium package for a year it costs 5,000 naira. then also for our mission processes are free of charge please who is sharing his screen okay that's insane Okay. Okay, so I think it says trying to play us a video on study globally. So let's take a look at what's going on.
Okay, guys, um, that was a short video of what services um, we provide at Study Globally Nigeria. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We are so pleased to have you in our midst. So this is our October edition of webinar brought to you by Study Globally Nigeria in collaboration with Society of Petroleum Engineers Portacus section, and we are glad to have you here. Before I get started, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Mass Hill Global Limited for their contributions to make this event a success. Um, our theme for this event is Trip to Postgraduate School, Autumn 2022. Um, this is an exciting time for people who have interest in studying abroad in 2022 or the year after. Please listen attentively because there will be a lot of take home points Feel free to ask questions in the chat box, drop suggestions, and there will be time to attend to it. Um, for more information, you can meet us on our social media platforms at Study Globally Nigeria. Join together at Study Globally Nigeria. Also, you can stop by our office locations. We have offices in Lagos and in Port Harcourt. Our Lagos office is located at 25 Church Street off Salvation Road, Opebi Ikeja, Lagos. Well, our Port Harcourt office is located at 33 Tombia Street, opposite GDI, GRA Phase 2 Port Harcourt. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a real time with us. Okay, thank you so much, Inse. Um, So the moment we've all been waiting for, let's introduce our first speaker in person of, she's a PhD holder. So y'all know that um, we'll be having a whole lot of information. So our first speaker is Oluwa Fumile Afu, Afu Afe. Please, madam, sorry if I don't get your name correctly. I am sorry. She <laughs> obtained her PhD degree in mechanical engineering and electrical engineering in Iowa State University, USA. She received her Bachelor of Engineering degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Benin, Nigeria. She currently works as a test R&D engineer at Intel Corporations USA. On completion of her undergraduate program, she started out as a process training engineer at EPCM Engineers Limited, an indigenous engineering consulting firm in Nigeria. She then took a step further, further on to Cypern Contracting Nigeria Limited, where she had the opportunity to contribute as a structural installation engineer on a, on a GINA oil feed development project, the biggest of sea project in Africa at the time. Before joining graduate school, she worked as a, she worked as a riser systems and hydrodynamics graduate engineer with Niger Star 7, sub C7 in Nigeria, France, and the United Kingdom. In graduate school, her, in graduate school, her research interests included bioelectronic magnetism, bioelectromagnetism, and finite element analysis. She is a well-published researcher and currently owns 10 publications to her name, having experienced the challenges of applying and transitioning to graduate school while also graduating within a short time. She believes she can inspire anyone planning for this journey. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We have an amazing speaker with us. From her profile, you know she is rich and she has a lot to deliver. So I hope you have your pen and your papers ready to take all she has to give. So Madam, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Ayikachi, for the warm introduction. And <laughs> you were really Queen. close to, <laughs> oh, it's Queen, all right, thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction. And you were close to pronouncing my name right. So yeah, I give that to you. Yeah. Um, so today, I guess you can see my screen, right? Can everyone see my screen? Yes, can see us. All right. Sorry. Okay, thank you. All right. So like Queen said, we'll be talking about uh, the trip to postgraduate school and um, I will just share some brief um, notes with you. And then I'll, uh, in the question time, question um, section, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to, to answer. So 
basically I've been asked to talk about um, the eligibility requirements, um, speaking for funds and um, finding a mentor. And so with um, eligibility requirements for graduate school, it's school dependent and it's also program dependent. By program dependent, I mean um, what course of study you are applying for in school based on the ranking of the schools. Um, so um, basically in the US, we have um, schools are ranked based on, um, I think their quality of research and fundings and number of students. And so with that in mind, um, different schools um, um, require different, um, I mean, have different requirements for application to graduate school. And so the general requirement, however, is your CGPA, which is either your undergrad CGPA or if you have a postgraduate, um, like a post, you have a postgraduate um, degree, uh, your CGPA and the GRE. Uh, we all know about the GRE and the English requirements. Some schools, most schools actually require TOEFL. Some other schools um, accept IELTS. And then your work experience also comes in handy, uh, the skills you have gathered over time, uh, research experience, your internships, and your volunteering experience all come in handy. And then you also have um, recommendation letters, which would be required um, from either your professors or colleagues that you have worked with, colleagues at work, and then you have your resume. Uh, so many people would usually say, okay, they don't have good CGPAs um, from their undergrad program. Uh, usually what I tell friends who ask me about that is if you do not have good CGPA, um, your GRE scores or your work experience can actually make up for that. So uh, for those planning to go into grad school, um, especially in the coming year or that's 2020 spring or fall of 2022, uh, gathering enough um, work experience, maybe from um, your national youth service or your, I mean, like real proper paid jobs or the skills you develop yourself over time or research experience like writing publications could actually make up for your CGPA. And when I talk about skills, I, I mean, um, yeah, skills like maybe um, learning softwares, um, programming languages, and any skills that is really related to the program, your intended program uh, should come in handy. And yeah, recommendation letters, you wanna be sure to um, select people who would write you good recommendation letters, uh, people who you know can um, actually vouch for your academic um, performances. And yeah, people who you know um, would be ready at any time to write you a very good recommendation letter. And then your resume, you want to tailor your resume to the program you're applying to. Uh, yeah, and also there are dead, um, application deadlines for most schools. And um, most programs also have varying um, application deadlines. So you want to do well to check that um, basically before applying. So that would help you prepare. Either you have to take your GRE exam, you can prepare months ahead. Uh, before you turn in your application. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna move on to funding opportunities. Um, there are several sources of funding uh, for postgraduate programs uh, in the US. I, yeah, in the US, I will be talking mostly about the US because that's kind of where I have experience with. But there are other funding sources for other uh, schools in other, um, in other continents like the UK or uh, yeah. So for the US, um, these are majorly the funding sources that you can have. Uh, there are scholarships and grants, uh, which are merit-based, um, which you can get from the school itself, from the institution itself, or from the government, um, like the federal government of Nigeria. Um, I have friends who have, um, who have studied um, in the US because the Nigerian government um, sponsored them. I have friends currently from Ghana also who are in the US studying um, because their government sponsored them. So those opportunities are actually very limited. Um, yeah, they're very limited, but then um, they are still out there. And so there are also gender-based scholarships, um, mostly focused on women. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have um, scholarships that um, 
want to sponsor women to graduate school. There are also STEM-based scholarships, like you have uh, scholarships big, that, are, that are focused on programs such as um, machine learning, like research-based, research-focused um, grants. You have all of those. And yeah, other funding sources could come from assistantships. Those are the major funding sources in the US. So if you see most people in coming to the US, they actually come in through, um, through assistantships. And there are basically three types of assistantships. You have the graduate teaching assistant, which um, is shortened for the GTA, and the graduate research assistant, um, which is shortened for GRA, and the graduate administrative assistant, which is GAA. So the, the content of these assistantships are, um, are school, also school dependent and they are program dependent. So basically um, the assistantship would cover for your tuition and you also earn a, a stipend while, um, while on your program. So for teaching assistants, um, what you would basically be doing would be to teach maybe undergrad courses, um, undergraduate courses, or you might be assisting um, lecturers, professors, um, um, with teaching some graduates, um, some graduate program. For the research assistant, um, research, research assistantship, you get to conduct research and why you also get paid for it. For some program, um, the research you conduct might be what you use for your, um, for your dissertation, uh, while some other program will make you do something totally different from your dissertation. So it all depends on, um, it all depends on what you sign, um, more like the, the agreement between you and whoever is sponsoring your assistantship. And there's a graduate administrative assistant. Um, for the GAA, it's basically just doing administrative work, um, maybe like of, um, bookkeeping, um, holding office hours, um, helping in the registrar's office, something administrative. So you get, your tuition gets paid and you also earn a stipend while doing that. And so there are percentages um, of sponsorship you could get, um, okay, depending on what degree you're applying for, um, be it a PhD or a master's program. So I'll speak from my own school perspective, Iowa State University, you would always have, um, for the PhD program, if you're fully funded, um, okay, it's called 50% um, half time assistantship, that's what it, it's called. So you get to work for 20 hours and then your tuition is um, fully funded and you get a stipend, a monthly stipend. Uh, for a master's program, if you're sponsored on an half time, uh, you get half of your tuition paid and you also earn a stipend while working. So you wanna check that with whatever school you're applying to and whatever program uh, you're also applying to. And so there is also, um, you can also get funds from personal funds, um, maybe savings. Um, I was trying to save up for graduate school <laughs> while working. Um, well, sometimes it's not really that easy because graduate school is expensive. So um, for master's student, um, I've heard some master's student um, save up for grad school and um, some get sponsored by their family and friends. It's, it's uh, so grad, grad, grad school is, uh, is expensive. And yeah, you might wanna consider that very well um, before you take that option. And also you could also get um, loans, oh, sorry, uh, loans and financial aid. I, I can, yeah. So uh, loans and financial aid, um, I usually don't advise that because uh, I've had some of my friends say, oh, they want to go get loan um, to come to school in the U.S. I'm like, you know what, just, just don't stress because um, life in the U.S. is, is stressful. Uh, grad school is stressful, emotionally draining, and um, having to deal with the issue of money or funds, it's not something you want to include in that stress. So usually I don't advise people to borrow um, money for grad school. Rather, I usually ask them to either look at the assistantship option or go for the scholarship option. Yeah, so that'll be it on funding opportunities. And then um, sending cold emails. Um, if I understand this well, I guess it's um, more like sending emails to potential advisors you want to um, work with. And so usually, um, 
yeah, I think I'm going to talk about that in my next slide. But then um, sending code emails, um, mostly with regards to the assistantship um, funding opportunities, you want to reach out to professors, um, asking them if they can fund your graduate program. Uh, you want to ask them if um, they have available research opportunities that um, you can apply to, or maybe just letting them know that you would like to be um, their potential student. And so basically what such emails should contain, I, I took a copy of, um, of one of the emails I sent to a professor while applying for, for my own program while trying to get um, into grad school. And it's just gonna be a basic, um, more like something you should look out for when you're trying to write um, an email or like send an email to an advisor. So basically you wanna be sure of the, the subject, let the subject be catchy enough you know, so that even without <laughs> reading the content, uh, they know what you're talking about. So you can say prospective graduate student for spring 2022 or um, interested in your research, something just to catch the um, attention, uh, sorry. Something just to catch the attention of um, just to catch the attention of um, of the advisor or of the supervisor or whoever is in charge of the assistantship. Yeah, and the next thing is you want to be sure you're addressing um, whoever you want your email to go to. Be sure to be on the lookout to address such person um, by their title, and be sure you also sending it to the right person because I know so many of us because we we want to send bulk emails I, I I actually sent a lot of emails while trying to get into grad school and so you can actually make a mistake in in while you're copying and pasting then you forget to change the name of the uh of the the next advisor you're trying to address your email to so you want to be on the lookout for that be sure to um to check the the person you're emailing to. And then the first um, the first paragraph would usually be you introducing yourself, like, oh, I am Afuakwe Uluakwamile. I graduated from University of Benin, and I am interested in pursuing a postgraduate program in this and with a research um, interest in this. It doesn't have to be too lengthy. One thing I would tell you is that these professors, uh, these um, lecturers are really busy. And so they, they don't have the time to read so long an email. So you just wanna be, you just wanna catch their attention, um, go straight to the point and um, ask for what you need, like um, just demand what you need. And so, yeah, you introduce yourself in the first paragraph. The second paragraph mostly is you talking about your experience or what you've done or your achievement or what you think they should know. Like, oh, I've been able to achieve this. I, this is my work experience. If you had an achievement, maybe you graduated as the best graduating student, you can add, add it there. Um, maybe um, you, you, you developed something or you designed something or you had, um, you built a software, something like that. Um, just be sure to include it in that um, second paragraph. So the second paragraph, paragraph is more like you selling yourself, like this is what I have done. and. More like this is the reason why I think I can fit into your your research group. This is what aligns. Um, I mean, this is the experience I have that I think aligns with your research interest. So you want to put that in the second second um, um, paragraph and say, oh, this is this is what I have done and this is what I bring uh, to the table. So that's what the second paragraph is about. And one other thing that is catchy that you can um, that catches the um, professor's attention is when you tell them, oh, I have read your publication, or I have been following your research, or I have seen your work so and so, I attended a conference where I, I saw your work was displayed. So you want to let them know that you are not just interested in their research because you're coming to, because you want to leave your country and come to, to grad school, no, but because you're really, you want to show them that you're really interested in what they do. And so when you tell them, okay, I've read one of your publications or I made use of it, um, of a, a program or a code you developed, I used it in my own work, or there was this your theory that, <laughs> that you, you wrote about and I read through it and I just have 
few questions. You can even ask them, oh, I just have a few questions about your publication, this publication that I heard, read. So it's just for them to know that, oh, this person has actually researched about me and they know, he or she knows what, what I'm into. And so that by that, they can ascertain that, oh, you have actually thought about it and you actually check if you really fit into their research group. So you want to spell that out. out. That is actually a plus. And um, yeah, then do not forget to attach your resume and your transcript. Uh, so with assistantships, like I mentioned on uh, earlier on, um, professors would usually recommend you to the to the graduate program. So if if you if you contact them ahead, like um, you're able to talk to them ahead um, before the application process, and they are able to read your emails or reply to it they kind of are able to recommend you for the program. And so that kind of um, streamlines or gets you closer to the door because you have somebody um, who has gone through your profile. If you have, okay, who has gone through your profile or read your resume or read your transcript and you have um, kind of built a relationship, like started communicating with this person, it's easier because they, um, the graduate program would not now have to sort through the so many uh, applications they received. You have someone going there to, to request um, a spot for you. So you want to do that. And if you have um, maybe a research profile, you have something you are, um, that is publicly renowned or you have a website or you developed something, you can also add a link to that, a link to whatever you've done. You can add it to the email so that they can actually look through it and yeah, also know who you are. So that, that's just something basic, um, yeah. Um, that you can use. And then finally, getting a mentor. Uh, so the mentor, like I understood, is getting your research, um, like your research advisor. Yeah, because when you come into grad school, the assistantship portion, you would have to work with an advisor. Um, yeah, especially the, the research aspect. So um, I believe that um, with getting a mentor, you want to create um, a a working relationship. You want to get someone you can work with, someone who is professional and who would also, someone who will be, um, what's the right word? Someone who is professional and who will be on the lookout for you. You want to, you want to um, choose an advisor that you can work with. Yeah. So when I came into grad school, um, maybe I should just share this. When I came into grad school, it was it was not that easy for me. I came into grad school as um, a graduate teaching assistant. And of course, I needed to work on research so I could write my dissertation. I joined um, a lab and that didn't go very well. So I had to switch labs. And so when, when people come to talk to me, I tell them, OK, you want to be sure um, of who you want to work with. Um, you don't, like I said, Grad school is draining, it's emotionally draining. So you wanna eliminate all the unknowns <laughs> as much as possible. You wanna take away anything that would stress or that would drain you. So working with a very good advisor, um, someone who has a well-established profile in that research area and someone who you can develop or build a good working relationship with would be very good. And so how do you source for this advice? So you can visit their research labs. Uh, you can do that virtually. I know some schools, they organize campus store. Um, it's, it's, a lot has changed because of COVID, but there are virtual stores. If you want to um, look into a professor's lab or you want to know what they are doing. The other thing I would recommend is that you ask their students. So you know students of professors through, through their, their research website. Most established um, professors have research websites um, where you can like stream, um, look at what they do and the student they have. So usually I recommend that you email such students and ask them about their professors, like their working relationship, like how long does it take to graduate if you get into this research lab? or how is the working relationship with your professor, what are his expectations, how does he grade and things like that. So that's the, the, the major thing. You wanna ask your, your senior colleagues, what do you think about this person? Do you think I should come into this lab? Uh, do you think I would be a good fit? Or do you think, what has been your experience? You, so you should ask, what has been your experience working with this person? Because 
honestly, your advisor is key to your success in grad school. And if you get it wrong, it means it's gonna either delay your time um, in grad school. Um, there's been situations where some people had to leave grad school without the degree they intended, um, uh, I mean, what they came in for. So some people came in for, um, for a PhD and they left maybe with a master's, maybe even after five years, when you would have expected they should be graduating with a PhD. And that was based on their relationship with the advisors. So you wanna check that um, before coming into grad school. And you should also read their publications, like I mentioned earlier on. You can find publications of um, intending mentors on um, Google Scholar, ResearchGate, a lot of website outside, out, out, um, outside there. You can read their codes. Uh, um, there's GitHub and all of those. So yeah, research about your advice. So, um, because they are key to your success in grad school. Yeah, research about them. <laughs> and yeah, getting a mentor based on funding too. Like I said earlier on, um, maybe I should complete, um, I should finish my story. So when I left that lab, I um, at, at some point I actually felt like leaving graduate school. I, I, I almost left graduate school. So I came into graduate school August, let me be sure I'm still within time. I came into graduate school August, 2018. And by October, 2019, I was dreaming of leaving graduate school cause I was almost frustrated. And so I remember one evening I was just <laughs> walking through my lab. I was leaving my lab after crying and everything. And then I saw this advert, oh, there was this professor looking for um, a research assistant, he had funding at the time. And so I walked up to him and I'm like, oh, I wanna be a part of your research group. And I was like, sure. But then I had to explain to him that I've been in this lab and I don't know if you will be able to um, take me in. Anyways, long story short, he took me in, but because he, he, he did not have an appointment in the program I was, I came in for mechanical engineering. He was in electrical engineering. So he, he still needed an advisor in mechanical engineering to oversee me. So I had to still talk to my, my previous um, advisor and yeah, I got her to, to still advise me. And that's the reason why I, I graduated with actually two PhD degrees, um, which is PhD in mechanical engineering and PhD in electrical engineering, just because I got those two job, um, those advisors. So funding sometimes can be a blessing and funding, um, and and research also because you can get research that that is um interdisciplinary um re research that um that is between different departments and you have you get advisors from those two different departments and also maybe the funding the grant is from two di different professors and so you get them to to advise you so be on the lookout for those those are actually um so I would say for me, it was a blessing for me because at the end of the day, I, I left school. Um, I, I, I completed my PhD degree in three years and with a double degree. So those are things you want to look out for also. And then you can also get a mentor based on recommendations. If you have um, friends in the school, the potential school you're looking into coming, uh, you can ask them to speak to um, their professors if they're willing to take you. I've had um, friends reach out to me to, to walk up to professors on their behalf. Um, that was when I was in school and ask if they can be funded um, by those professors. So yeah, that's just the, the basic for now. And yeah, I heard this in red. It's okay to change advisors. It's okay to switch labs and it's okay to change research area. Sometimes graduate school journey doesn't always go um, it doesn't, it's, it's full of ups and downs. I, if you had told me, I would have thought of quitting graduate school, I would say no. But at some point I needed to make that decision and I changed my advisors, I switched labs. So it's okay to do that. And yeah, you just look on the brighter side. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I guess if you have questions, I would take them. Um, I would okay. take them. Thank you, Oluwa Pumile. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed that session. It was very, very, very enlightening. 
So, so far, what I got that we, your, for the general requirements, you need a very good CGPA. And if your CGPA is not very good, your work experience and your skills that you have, that you gain from volunteering, working internships and all that can actually make up for your CGPA. And you need to have your GRE um, that is required in some schools and then your English um, proficiency and then your recommendation letters, you should be like very um, strategic when you're choosing um, your, your referees, persons that are going to write your recommendation letters for you so that they would actually put in good recommendations for you, have a good resume, and then be very much aware of the application deadline so that you don't miss out. So in sending your cold mails, make sure your, um, your email subject is catchy Research on the lecturer, know their publications, know their works, know how you relate with them in terms of the work they've done so that they understand that you know what you're coming in for. Let your meal not be too long and ambiguous. Just make it so short and concise. Let it be straight to the point. Make sure you sell yourself very well. If you have any good points, any valid points, like the best graduate student, you have a first class and stuff like that, put it out there. If you have any work you've done, make sure you add the link to your work so that they can actually make reference to the things you've done and see how serious you are about your whole journey. Then for your funding opportunities, you have scholarship, different scholarship opportunities, then you have the assistantship positions, and then you can also use for your personal savings as well as taking loans from agencies or from the school, though she didn't really advise us to take loans. And that can be very understandable. So, it's, it, I think it's a very stressful situation to be thinking of how to pay back loans instead of focusing entirely on your academics. And then when getting a mentor, research on the person you want to get as a mentor, ask questions from those ahead of you to be able to point you in the right direction, read through the works that, the, that your potential mentor has done so that you have full information on who these persons are. So we'll be taking the questions immediately after the second speaker. So we'll be going next to our second presentation from Emmanuel Obasi. So, Emmanuel Obasi is an MSc, has an MSc in Petroleum Engineering, and he's a graduate research assistant at the Hydrocarbon Lab University of Women USA. He graduated with a first class degree in petroleum engineering from Federal University of Technology, Owere. Being a very motivated petroleum engineer, he has a clear and logical mind with a very practical approach to problem solving and a drive to see things through completions. With basic experience in reservoir engineering and production optimization, technical skills in integrated petroleum modeling and programming. He possesses effective leadership skills, which has enabled him to work, motivate, and learn from people around him. His ability to work under pressure with tight deadlines without compromising quality is one of his conspicuous skills. Please, uh, this, this profile is very, very amazing. I'm, I'm very sure that we are going to learn a whole lot straight from a first class degree holder. It's not easy. Please, let's welcome our speaker, Manuel Obasi. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Queen, for um, that introduction. I don't know if you can hear me. Please, can you confirm that you can hear me while I share my screen? can hear you. All right. So, yeah, so can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So yes, my name is Emmanuel Obasi. Uh, my name is C Students and Graduate Research Assistant at the Department of Petroleum Engineering, University of Wyoming, USA. So I've been invited to speak on the trip to postgraduate school for fall 2022. 
and I won't, I'll be, so I'll, I'll be covering these outlines. First of all, I would be speaking on how to get started. It, graduate school can be a very, very ambiguous um, uh, journey, right? So most people are lost in the whole process of, okay, what do I do or how do I start? So I would, I would be taking it from the very scratch on what to do and how to get started. And also I'll look at uh, writing a stellar statement of purpose because um, like you had from our previous speaker, statement of purpose is also one critical document that is very, very important in your application process. And also I'll also talk about funding opportunities. I would just add, throw more light towards um, uh, the first speaker, our uh, first speaker has said. And finally, I would also talk, talk on mentorship from the other perspective. So she looked at the first perspective. I would talk on me mentorship from the other perspective. So getting started. So what 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 do what, what do you want to do, right? So before you get to this point, right? I would I, I like to start with this, right? Um, graduate school is not for everybody, right? You have to really understand the fact that it's not for everyone, and you and getting this understanding would clearly define what what goes goes on for you, right? Many people have this uh, mindset that oh. Uh, you were, after your undergrad, you must do um, your your postgraduate school. I mean, some people don't have this passion for 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 studies or for education, right? They do Some people are very business oriented. They want to enter into entrepreneurship. They want to do other things. So, if you're that kind of person, I mean, it's not for you. But if you are someone that that you want to you, you want to advance in your career in your working career, and you know that of course postgraduate school is very critical for your career growth so it means that it's for you right and you, of course you have to be very very passionate about this um, um, graduate school and again being passionate means that you have to put in all the whole efforts in this in this journey like our first speaker can uh, can, re can really confirm graduate school can be very very overwhelming so one thing people is that they like to hear success story probably when you go to linkedin you see a lot of people sharing their success story on how they got into graduate school and how they got scholarship and all that and all that so you, you get motivated at that particular instance and oh you want to do this you want to do this i get excited you get motivated but then when they start telling you the whole process and the whole journey and what it took them and over time you lose the discipline and all that so first of all you have to be very you have to know that oh you're into is a job on its own right graduate school graduate application process is a job on its own as as you have other jobs that you go every day you go to work probably some people work from from five from five from nine to five so it's, it's a job on its own it requires a whole lot of commitment so first thing first so what do you want to do so if you've made up your mind i mean i mean everyone here I, I I can imagine that we are all ready for grad school we are all ready we've made up our mind okay this is this, this is the path we want to do and so first and first, what do you want to do? You can see this picture is highlighting the fact that it's highlighting, oh, someone is confused. What should I do first? So I think this is the place where people get confused a lot. So what are those first things to do and how can I do them? So, yeah. So the first thing that you want to look at is the choice of graduate program. You want to see, okay, what do I want to do for grad school if it's something I did on, in my undergraduate or I want to explore other new path? because some people your undergraduate course may be uh, something that was forced on you right you're not really passionate about it. you didn't enjoy it and graduate school is an, is an opportunity for you to you want to switch switch um, switch discipline or switch pro your program so first 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 thing you're looking at your choice of program second thing is the choice of university i mean after you've selected after you've been cleared on the choice of graduate program the next thing is okay which universities because the thing is, there's a lot of universities in the United States here that offer different programs. You may be very, very um, confused about oh, which university I want to go to, what's the best university for this program, and, and all that. So this is really very, very important in, in, in considering um, one of those things you want to consider in grad school, choice of university. And lastly, the choice of location. It can be very, very, uh, let's say, inconsequential, but choice of location is very important. You, there, there are different regions in the United States, it's different um, climate and all that. So you also want to pay attention to the choice of location. So graduate program. So what are those things to consider when you want to select your graduate program, when you want to select this particular, what I want to do for graduate school? So the first thing, first, first thing you want to consider is your passion. 
research trend and relevance, right? You have to be passionate about um, whatever course you're going to you want to do in graduate school. It's not like undergraduates that in your undergraduate um, 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 course that you can just rigmarole and play around your way towards graduation. I mean, especially in Nigeria where the educational system is not that intense like that. You may not be really be passionate about the course. You just wanted to go to university and then maybe fulfill your dreams or fulfill your your your, your dreams of going to university in Nigeria. But graduate school is not like that, right? You have to be passionate about what you want to do because it's a very long process. You just heard from our first speaker how it can be very frustrating at times. I mean, I, I, I've with experience here over time, I've, I've known that it's very, very tedious. Right? You've been doing a lot of work, right? So if you're not passionate about what you want to do, I mean, you may just lose at, at, at um, even before you, you get to your final destination. So you have to be passionate about what you want to do. You have to check the research trend and relevance. So what is the current research trend in this particular program? What are those things they're looking out for in the future? Because you just you still want to be relevant in the future, right? So you want to check the research trend and the relevance of that particular discipline or that particular course in the future. So if you know that, if you've checked about all this and you've seen that, oh, it's 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 going to make waves in the future, it's something that you want to consider. Well, if it's, if it's something that oh, in the, in in the very it's it's already fading away. There's no current research trend, and I mean there's no really very good significant relevance relevance is you may want to consider other programs, right? So the other part is availability of funding opportunities. I mean, I can tell you categorically that there are some programs that are that are highly funded, right, compared to other programs, right? And yes, they are very, they are, they are good programs that are very funded compared to other programs. So, I mean, the bias is not because of one is very important or the other. I mean, it's because of the, it's because of the current, um, the relevance of that particular course to the United States of America here and also to the world at large, right? So like you can see courses like um, um, uh, uh, yeah, physical sciences, biological sciences, middle courses in, the, in STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. These are programs that are very, very funded, right? And I can tell you that this is also something that you also want to consider as well. So lastly, is the career opportunities in the field of study. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't think that anyone would, would have a mindset of just going to school for going for, for just going for those going to school, right? The purpose of going to graduate school is just to attend the university and that's all. You also want to think higher. You want also you also want to consider your career opportunities after graduation. So are they are they career opportunities in the US? Do you still want to see you do you do you want to transition into the working environment after your graduate studies? So these are those things that you should consider as well because if there are career opportunities, it gives you an idea, okay, this this particular course should be very good, right? I should I should tour towards this direction. And these are the three things I think you should, should consider um, when selecting um, um, graduate programs, right? So, so choice of university, things to consider, right? I mean, if you've selected a program and or you have a program in mind, maybe you may not be very clear, it may be very ambiguous. So you just select two, three courses in, in your mind. So the next part is the choice of university. So what, what are the things to consider for the choice of university, right? So research about the schools, right? There are a lot of schools in the United States. When I started applying for graduate school in 2020, I mean, I, 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 was, I was just trying, I was kind of comp completing my, my undergraduate in 2019. And in 2019, I was very, it was very unclear to me, right? I don't, I barely know about 10 universities in the US. I mean, because, and that already is already streamlining my, my whole idea of, okay, the opportunities I want to explore. But then there's a lot of universities in the United States. There are over 2,000 colleges in the United States here. So you want to know about the schools. You want to know about the program. There's, I'm very certain that there's some schools that you've never heard of, right? That, but they, they exist, right? So there are a lot of universities. So you want to check those universities. And where you can check about those universities is you, you, you want to visit the academic website. I mean, if you know, if you already know the schools, check the website of the schools. If you don't know the schools, there are platforms where you can get a lot of ideas about schools. You can visit www.usnews.com. It gives you a lot of school, all the schools in the United States. You want to visit www.petersen.com. Also, www.degradcalf.com. These are websites, right? These are good websites that you can explore ex and exploit a lot of schools, right? And one important thing about this thing is they don't just give you information. They don't just tell you about the school. They give you a breakdown, detailed breakdown of how you can get funding, 
um, what are their admission rates and their requirements. And of course, for www.graduate grad, grad calf, it gives you an update on the admission process, right? For each school, it's a platform, it's an academic platform of graduates and postgraduate students, that um, undergrad and, and postgraduate students that, of course, they share, they won't share the experience of, of how it has been so far. And lastly, grad, grad fair, a lot of graduate fair that's been organized by different organizations like Education USA and, and the rest, right? When you attend those graduate fair, you see a lot of schools, you engage in, 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 in a lot of conversation with these schools. You have, you have an idea of, okay, what this particular school is, is all about. So yeah, moving on, university ranking. So after searching of the schools, you now have a good bank of schools, right? You've, you've probably gotten a lot of schools. You've written down first time. I would always advise you write down like 30 or 40 list of schools, right? You want to explore, right? The next thing is, okay, of course, you're not going to apply to those 30 or 40 schools, right? You want to also streamline the option. You want to, you want to bring out the best, um, um, you want to say explore and see, okay, which one will I finally apply to? So you have to check the university ranking. It's very important, right? So the, how you that, that two types of um, university ranking there's a general ranking and the discipline particular discipline ranking okay there's a general ranking okay what's the what's the ranking in terms of uh, of uh, in terms of universities in the united states so where is this particular school why you want to check the ranking is, is because of the different ranking affects that there are different um ad admission process and, and and how they take students right every school have the admission rates every school have their graduation rates so the general ranking gives you an idea of, okay where's the ranking of this school in terms of all the universities in the united states and in discipline ranking okay if you probably are lo looking at going going for an engineering course so you want to check okay what is this particular school's ranking in engineering and also going down to your particular course what is this particular school's ranking in terms of is it petroleum engineering is it mechanical is the health sciences is it chemistry whatsoever right it gives you an idea because you want to know okay if the school is very very good for this particular program i want to apply to right so lastly after you're done right note the academic and application windows for these schools right because i tell you in the united states here there are two um, um, windows right there's the fall and there's the spring right when people apply for admission right for fall the academic is from august to december and the window the application window is from october this and december the preceding year some schools can even go further to january of january right of february so take for instance you're applying for 2022 fall right so so if you're applying for 2022 fall we are already in 2021 fall so i'm we're currently in, in the academic session 2021 fall and the window for for 2022 fall next year opens from october some schools even start from september but most schools start from october till december this year and maybe january or february next year so that's for, for fall 2022. So also this is also for spring. So spring, the academic season from January to May, and the window is usually August 31st and September 30th. So this is like the application deadline period, August 31st or September 30th. So of course it means that for spring 2020, 2022, most schools, the deadline is already up, right? Except for some very few schools that also see, are still admitting students, right? If you want to know more about this, you can visit the school's website and you see it clearly there. So like this, this is like a general um, um, information, right? So now the choice of, of academic location. So get to know about that. One. Let me, the, the truth is, the, why is, this may not really be very important, but of course, it's still, it's still, it's quite, it's quite important that you also get to know about your academic location. There are, very, there are different regions in the United States. There's the Northeast, the Midwest, the South and West, right? And this particular region, they, they, they have varying, temperature and climate change right there are some places that are very very cold especially where i am i mean the university of wyoming wyoming is like one of the coldest uh, um, states in the united states right and it's very very cold here i mean it's already already winter here we've already had snow and some people may really not be very very conversant with okay some some, some people may be allergic to different temperature change and all that they don't can, cannot stand a very cold temperature because here it gets to minus 30 degrees, minus 40 degrees in January. And so these are the things you also want to consider. So is it, is it very good for me or should I really consider coming to this place or not? So yeah, of course you should also consider that. So the next part is the social and cultural ideologies. The United States is very different, right? It's, it's, it's a vast community of, of different ramifications, right? Especially for places that we where if you 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 will also want to check about the history of the particular city or state you want, you're coming to right 
you want to go back to history, especially, I, I also give an example here, University of Wyoming, the state of Wyoming here. If you look down the history of the United States, they were dominated by red, red Indians, right? So it gives you an idea, idea of, okay, some people, you, you, hear state, you, hear, you hear names like Wyoming, Laramie, Cheyenne, and you want to wonder, is it an Asian place? But then it's part of the history of, of it is part of the history of the US, right? They were once dominated by the Red Indians and all that, right? So it gives you an idea of the kind of people you may see here. And also, you also want to check about their social ideology, if they are very, um, they, they are very receptive to international students, if they are Black, um, Africans here, Black people here, and how they relate. So you, these are those things that you also want to consider, right, at the side. So now, after you've um, considered all these, and then you want to start your application process, I'm, I'll, I'm very, very happy that um, my first speaker has talked about the documents and the application process. You would fill an online application. Uh, the online application online is very important to fill some particular details and all that. And then you submit documents, your statement of purpose. You, you had to talk about the, the standardized exams like GRE and English proficiency tests, and also statement of purpose, your CV and recommendation letter. Very important. So I'll be spending more time on, the stellar, uh, on statement of purpose and how to write statement of purpose, which is a very, very important um, um, document, right? So now, what exactly is a statement of purpose, right? So the whole application process is very, very important. So don't, don't, don't think that, oh, one part of the application is, is way higher, very, way important than the other part. They have the same importance because they consider every of those documents simultaneously, right? So don't say, oh, I, I, many people have this idea, they focus more on standardized tests. And I've seen this with experience, they focus more on writing GRE than that other part of the application so far, right? The focus more on, it's very good, you prepare well for GRE exams and all that, but also note that you also have to pay attention to other parts because it's 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 the whole, they, they, they consider your application simultaneously with all those documents you share, right? So one of those important documents is the statement of purpose. I mean, it's the very first document that they would, they would, they would tell you to, 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 to submit, right? And it's very, very critical that you, you turn in a very strong statement of purpose. When you're applying to graduate school, always have this mindset that you're not the only one applying, right? There are various people applying for the same position, the same, the same admission as you are, right? Not just in Nigeria, every part of the world. And also remember that the graduate school or postgraduate school is not like undergraduate ed 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 education that they, they, can, they can take a lot of people, right? A lot of students. So that graduate school has a very limited number of, of candidates they select. So you want to be at the top of your game. You want to make place yourself at that, at, at, uh, at, at that point where you are kind of above every other person applying, right? So it means that your, all your applications, every single part of the application must be very, 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 very strong. And statement of purpose is that one particular document that should be very strong. So what is the statement of purpose? So this document, it's, it gives the admissions committee an information about who they are taking, right? About you that is applying. Oh, you want to come to this grad school? Okay. Yeah, the guidance committee is like thinking, okay, who is this person? We want to know this person. We want to know why this person should be selected um, um, why should we select this person and don't select this other person, right? So it's a place where you sell yourself, like it's a market, it's a, like a mini market, right? Where you want to sell yourself about, about yourself, right? And there are various things that should be contained in your statement of purpose. So it tells you who you are, what you want to study at graduate school, why you want to study that particular course, and the experience you have in that field. If you have if you have various experience, if probably if you have worked in the industry, they want to see if you're working in the industry and your career plans with this degree. So they don't, don't they don't just want to have, just take you for okay because you want to go to grad school. They want to know why this particular particular um, program would be very important to you, right, for your career growth and all that. So these are those particular things they, they want to see, and. I'll be sharing some tips on writing a, a, a good statement of purpose. So um, the first is please be yourself. A lot of people can be very exaggerating in, in, in their statement of purpose. Oh, they want to, they, 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 they want this multi-million dollar story. They want to tell this multi-million dollar story that can be very touching. So and at the end of the day, they tend to lie, right? So please be yourself and don't lie. 
everybody have a story. Don't don't say you don't have a story. You probably may not have done a lot of things, but I mean, be yourself. If you followed your steps of writing statement of purpose, you can write a very good statement statement of purpose, right? Please be yourself. So don't lie. Don't be don't be too exaggerating at all, please. And uh, next part is write a strong opening, right? I mean, let me tell you something. The Gary Committee is reviewing a lot of a lot of applications, so. They don't have time to be to be okay. Be conscious. Ah, I can't really understand this thing. Okay, let me read further and say, once they once they discover a part where, especially the, your strong, your especially the opening part of your of your SOP, if the opening part of the SOP is not strong, if it's boring, I mean, it's, it's, it's already a red flag because they don't really want to waste time. They probably may move to another person and then um, cancel your application, right? So you have to have a very strong opening. The very first paragraph should be very 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 strong and catchy. So also three, describe an important experience that is relevant to your program of interest. If you have experience in the past, probably you have worked in the industry, in, in probably the program you're applying to, you want to describe those experiences. If you've, if you've done research in that particular area, probably you have publication and all that, you also want to describe it. So four, be specific, concise, honest, and unique. I've talked about being honest, right? Be specific, don't be too ambiguous. Don't talk about a lot of things and start um, writing an autobiography, give us history. I mean, because let me tell you one thing, statement of purpose have word limits, right? In some schools, they may just say um, 500 to 700 words, right? In other schools, they may say no less than two pages, right? So you, you have to be very specific and concise and also honest and unique. So the fifth one is describe why you are a good match for this program, for that program. They want to see that, oh, I am actually taking someone that is a good match for a program. I don't want to take any other person. So you have to describe why they sh you should be selected and not other person. So like I said, always put yourself in that mindset. Don't always have that mindset that you're not the only one applying. So what can I do differently, right? And that, that would make me, make me stand out, right? make me a good match for their program. And six, talk about your goals, talk about your achievement, talk about if you have a first class, if you have you've won a lot of awards, if you've done a lot of things, please talk about your goals. Talk about your achievement, and not just your achievement. Talk about your goals. What are your career goals? What is what is that thing that that you want to do after graduation? It's very very important. So things to avoid while write, when writing a statement of purpose. The first thing is please avoid errors. So when you have errors, maybe misspelling or poor English, right? It's, it's, it's already a red flag on your side. So it's already a red flag on the garage committee. So you. Don't, don't want to present yourself as someone that is not really proficient in spoken English. So I would recommend you use Grammarly. Please use Grammarly. Grammarly is an app that helps you correct spelling errors, poor grammatical expression, and all that. Please use Grammarly. It's kind of a page. It's an app. Please check for that app and use Grammarly. So the second part is don't be too personal in your essay. Do not focus on deep personal problems. Some people may be very carried away by their, by their situation. I mean, some people may, may might have come through the ranks of a poor background, right? And maybe they've suffered through um, undergraduate school and probably through taking care of themselves. So they want to express themselves fully. They want to, do not present yourself in such a way that the guy committee would want to pity you, right? Don't show pity, right? You want to express yourself. You have to tell your personal story, but don't be too... Don't focus deeply on, 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 on your personal problems, right? Uh, because it can really be a sign of, okay, you are very, very, you are desperate. You are begging for a particular position, which you, you, you shouldn't be doing. So the third part, don't be repetitive or too general in your statements, right? Don't repeat words, right? Do not repeat words. So once you've stated something, be clear and you move on. And don't be general. Don't write a general statement of, of, of purpose. I see a lot of people write general statement of purpose. And oh, one of general statement of purpose, okay, they want to, they want to become a lecturer, which probably may not be true, but because it has already been repeated, a lot of people want to become lecturer, they want to become professors after after graduate school, they want to go to PhD. If you are doing a master, it's not it's not a more that you want to do a PhD, right? So don't 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 feel like oh, I would want to convince them that uh, if I don't convince them that I want to do a PhD, you won't be accepted. No, don't be general, right? So write what you know, right? Write what you want to do. Express yourself very well and be and be very honest. So don't don't write an autobiography. I've said it, I said that don't write a lot of things about yourself. You want to give us origin of how where you started, how you were born, and all that. It's not really needed. Don't submit untruthful or irrelevant information in your essay. Please, I've said it. Don't lie. Don't say. Don't 
talk about an achievement that you did, you did not achieve, right? Don't talk about an award you didn't win or something that you didn't do because it can really backfire, right? In some cases, they may even do an interview, right? And then they want to even confirm these details. They want to do a background check of these details and they find out that it's false. It's automatically a red flag. They will not even admit you, right? So please avoid plagiarism. Do not write any other person's statement of purpose. Everyone has a unique story. So most people may want to say, oh, I don't have anything to write and they copy verbatim from other person's SOP. It is a total red flag. If they see plagiarism, it is a total red flag. So how then do you write your sample outline? So first part should be the introductory part, right? Please, it's very important that you get a very strong introduction. So if you want to, if you want to do it, because if you want to convince someone to keep on reading your, your SOP, your introduction must be catchy. So introduce yourself, your interest and your motivation. Have you be very strong and have your, your introduction must be very strong and eye catchy, right? You can start with giving a very famous quote, or you can start by telling a little story, right? Like, yeah, you can start with that, right? It gives anyone reading your SOP that mind that that's that okay, ah, okay, this person's SOP is, is, is kind of interesting. Please don't write a boring statement. If you write a boring introduction, it can be it can, it's a red, it can be that red flag that someone cannot even may not even want to be interested in reading your SOP. So summarize, second part, summarize your undergraduate and previous. The second paragraph, right? Maybe summarize your undergraduate and previous graduate experience. So, what is your undergraduate or previous graduate experience? If you've done an undergraduate course, tell us about the courses you, you did. What tell us about what you did in your undergraduate course? How you able to go about it, and what exactly you you, you did? If you have an MSc and applying for a PhD, you also want to add what you did in your, in your in your master's degree program as well. So, the third part is discuss the relevance of your your recent and current activities that's your achievement if you have achievement in your undergraduate course um whatever, whatever achievement achievements you've had please talk about it i mean if you've published any paper you want to talk about it if you've won awards please you want to talk about it so the fourth part is to elaborate talk, elaborate talk about why you are interested in that particular school and not other school it's very important. This particular part is always so important. You want to tell them that, oh, I'm very interested in this school. Like, what is the, that thing you see in this school that, that actually may, makes you want to apply to that school, right? So it's very important because the graduate committee will be, wow, 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 this person loves this about our school. And maybe that's very, very good. That, that's, that's, that's a very good thing, right? To see someone that is very passionate about coming to our school because he loves this about our school and all that, right? And also, you also want to state, include the particular research i mean your graduate postgraduate education or graduate um, um, studies as the case may be is research oriented right it can, is, is research oriented so if you're doing a master's a thesis master's is research oriented if you're doing a phd is research oriented so you want to also talk about what particular research area you want to work in right and also the faculty members you work, you wish to work with because it's very important in funding because if you talk about the faculty members you want to work in during the selection admission application during the consideration phase, they will forward your, your particular document to that particular professor you want to work with. And that, and that particular professor will have a chance to go through your, your academic, your credentials in order to okay, say, okay, maybe I, I, he, he, he may consider you for funding opportunities. So lastly, your career goes, please talk about your future plans after Gary. It's very important. They want to see your, your, your future projection. Is this guy, or is he, 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 does he have goals, right? Is it career oriented? They want to know what you want to do with upon graduation with the degree that you've achieved. So this particular paragraph should be explicitly written in clear terms. The this paragraph should be clearly written in clear terms, straight to the point, and with very, very good um, um, writing styles. So I think I have my statement of purpose here. I, I will just talk about it for just two minutes before I move on, because for the sake of time so like this is my statement of purpose this is like an excerpt this is my this is the first part and you can see that my statement of purpose sorry sorry let me so my statement of purpose is well structured you can see in different paragraphs right so first thing you want to do is like those particular parts we've talked about you want to add them in your statement of purpose right so this is like the introductory part. You can read it through, look at the second part, look at the third part. This is the fourth part when I talked about my academic journey, my strong desire, my, my experiences where I've worked on my internship in total and all that. 
and this is like the second part. So with time, I'm not, I'm just going to skip through this. And I just want to talk about funding opportunities for graduate school, right? So there are, there are two parts of um, funding opportunities like you've heard from our first speaker. We have the first part is the scholarship, fellowship and grants, scholarship for STEM, fellowship for women and other grants, right? So, but the main important scholarship is the graduate assistantship because this is where the, this is where the meat is. But this first part, it can be very, it can only really be sustainable, right? You may have, there are very few of this, this fellowship and scholarship that are sustainable. When I mean by sustainability, I mean that it can take you through your graduate program, can sustain you all through, right? There are very, very few, but the ones that, that is very sustainable is, is the graduate, graduate assistantship. You just want, you don't just want to apply to schools and get admission without funding because it's, it's of no, it's of no use. You want to apply to schools so that you can get funding because if you don't get, I me, mean, I, I didn't come from a very rich background, right? I, I come from an average fa family that I can, that can't, can't afford my education abroad, right? So giving me admission without funding is of no use, right? Because I won't be able to, to cater for my funding, pay tuition fees because there are millions of naira. So the same thing you, you don't just want to apply, you want to be strategic when applying. So you want to get funding. So the two types type of funding is graduate teaching assistantship and the graduate research assistantship. So the assistantship, so what, what, what does it entail, right? The graduate assistantship gives students opportunities for personal experience, academic training and financial support while pursuing your academic degrees, right? So it's want to make you very, 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 very capable to, to go through the, the, the program. So the workload is that for graduate assistantship, it entails 10 to 20 hours of work per week. So it has different full-time equivalent 0 0.25 for 10 hours and 20 hours 0 0.50 full-time. This, this, this equivalent, you may not really understand this, but it's, it directly relates to how much you'll be, you'll be paid for the particular assistantship. So now the, I, I'll talk about the teaching assistantship, the duties and the incentives. So the teaching assistantship is an academic program which provides stipends to students who assist in teaching during the academic year. So you want, you'll be assisting in teaching professor, teaching student, undergraduate student, right? Professors and faculty members would want to hire you so that you can assist them because one thing is that they don't they don't it's not like nigeria where the program is not structured in the us they have a very structured academic program they, they take care of the, the is, tutorials are very important classes are important lab sessions are important so these particular lecturers they don't have the time all the time to do all this job on their own because they also have research so they want to employ students that can help okay assist in grading students in marking scripts assignment and all that so they want to um, employ graduate international, mostly international students, right, for teaching assistantship. So what is the duties of the teaching assistant? So he or she would be would be assigned to teach or assist in a course under a supervision under a supervision of a direct uh, under a supervision of a director or mentor. So he or she would also be responsible for grading for a course and also tutoring. So the incentive is a full full tuition fee. So you don't have to pay any tuition fee or other fees. If the full TA position, you will not have to pay for tuition fee. It's covered for a tuition fee. Also covers for your health insurance because you may you may want to assess health facilities here in the US. Health is kind of costly, so they, they know that students cannot take care of it. So they give you health insurance, and also you've been paid in uh, uh, you've been paid a monthly stipend between one thousand three hundred US dollars to three thousand five hundred US dollars, depending on the school and depending on your program. Right. So research assistantship is the other way around. You are going to help and professors or faculty members in researching, right? Because these these professors they have grants from the school from the Department of Energy in the US and other organization in the US that comes to them, okay, to carry out research in different fields. So they are busy doing research. So they cannot do it alone because they have deadlines to meet for these companies and for the school and all, all that. So the higher students, and what you'll be doing, you'll be assisting in, in you'll, be, you'll be assisting the professor in um, lab work and the research projects for that particular um, professor. So the incentive, the same thing. You have a full tuition fee waiver and other fee. It covers your health insurance and a monthly stipend between 1,300 and, and 3,500 as the case may be. So what do you want to do to gain this, this, this teaching assistantship? Because this is what is very important. You don't want to get admission and not just, you, just want, you don't want to get admission and don't get funds. So what is very critical in getting teaching assistantship? Please and please, first of all, submit a very strong application, right? Because if you if you are not considered for admission, you cannot be considered for teaching assistantship. So once they don't take you for if you are, if you are not being admitted, you cannot be considered for teaching assistantship. So you want to submit a very strong application. That is why we talked about those submitting those documents and why it's very important. Second, please make sure you take the English proficiency test. Right, make sure you take um, either TOEFL, IET, or du Duolingo. Right, most of you may not know about Duolingo. Duolingo is a new English proficiency test. I mean, I took Duolingo last year. 
yeah so it's it depends on how uh, how how financially buoyant you are so but i usually advise people to take tofu because it's generally accepted everywhere so please submit make sure you take the english proficiency test and perform well why is it very important because teaching assistant you'll be teaching right you'll be assisting in teaching responsibilities and all that so they want to know if you're very fluent in, in spoken english because english is like the official language here and the first language so if you're not proficient in in, in english proficient in english you you won't be selected for a teaching assistantship. So you want to make sure that you have a very good score, and you are you and doing that would make you a step ahead of every other person. Please have a well written resume that highlights your teaching experiences. It's very important because they want to know. Okay, this person are, are we taking for teaching assistantship? How well is he very well? Is he very well grasped in in teaching? Right? Has he had teaching experience? So if your resume is showing that oh you have a very good teaching experience, it's a very 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 good mark for you. And always keep in touch with the graduate coordinator administrator. It is very important. You may see, it may be very, you may think it's, ah, it's, it's, it's the least point. But let me tell you, I want to show you a story, which is very, very important because it's, uh, in my next slide, I'll tell you why it's important. So strategies to getting um, research assistantship. So submit a strong application, like I've said, in, the, in, in teaching assistantship. Also, strategic code emailing to professors. Like my first speaker has said, it's very important that you send strategic code email and she has talked about code email i'm not going to talk about it so but please make sure you send at least 50 email you may think it's very ah it's very much but you won't you is the hustle right in nigeria it's you call it hustle i mean you don't want carry last right you want to put yourself in that particular place where you want to be taken right so as you search for job in nigeria the same way you do you you you, you search for teaching research assistantship right with all with your application so you have to strategically email professors Emailing professors is not just me, it's, it's not just like that. You have to strategically email professors. She has talked about how you can the whole the details of what your email can contain. Also, please, I also advise you to in, in a bit of being, being strategic, know when to email professors. So don't go and email professors in the night. So you have to be aware of the time zones. Know that you are you are you are like seven, six, or five hours ahead of people in the United States. So don't email professors in the night because when you email professor in the night, what happens is that before the next morning, other emails have, have already, I mean, he has, he has received a lot of email. An email may just be at the backlog, right? These professors are very busy. They don't have time to even sit and maybe spend like 30 minutes going through email. So it's those, those top emails they, they would likely, most likely respond to. So be strategic enough to email professors around morning session here because that's when they come to the lab. That's when they go through their email first thing in the morning. So make sure you send those mails then. Also track your mail. Make sure that you have email trackers that tells you when a professor reads your mail or not. And, and lastly, track how many emails you send. I mean, if you're sending more than 50 mails, it may be overwhelming, overwhelming to track those mails, right? So prepare an Excel sheet. Like when I was applying, I prepared an Excel sheet that was very strategic in the sense that I know, okay, the different professors in different schools I'm, I'm emailing, their different email address. If anyone responds to me, it's, it's, it's going to be tick that, oh, this person has responded. If it's positive or negative, I know that it's positive or negative. And then if it's negative, I move on. So, so you have to be very, very strategic. So make sure you submit a very good English proficiency test. I've talked about it. Start working on publication for your academic work. It is very important because for research assistants, they want to take students that have research experience, right? Professors want to take students that have research experience. So you want to Start working on publishing academic work. If, if, if you don't have any publication, maybe you're just finishing on undergrad and all that. I mean, it's it's very okay, right? But try and try make sure you start publishing your academic work. So have a very well-written resume that highlights your teaching experience and research experience. If you have if you have had research experience in school or anywhere whatsoever, please highlight that in your resume because it's going to give you that step ahead of any other person. Please attend graduate seminars, graduate fairs, and career fairs. It is very important because in graduate fairs, the schools, they invite many schools. And when they invite many schools, those schools gives you the opportunity to meet this professor. This professor you are trying to email or you have, are spending time to see that you can write a very good email and then they respond to your email. You have, sometimes you have a chance to even chat with them one-on-one -on -one in the graduate fair. And it's a very good important, very good what opportunity for you to sell yourself, right? I mean, if you are seeing a professor, you are conversing with the professor probably virtually, it's a very good opportunity to tell the professor that, okay, this, I want to work with you and this is what I want to do. So lastly, keep in touch with your graduate coordinator and, and instructor because when you keep on reminding them about, okay, I'm interested in your school, okay, what is the, what, what can I do and every other thing, make sure 
that you, you keep in touch with them because at the end of the day, if a particular professor or administrator, if there's any funding opportunity that comes in that school, you will be the first person to reach out because you're always in their mind, right? So lastly, mentorship. So this is where I conclude, right? Mentorship, there are two parts of mentorship. There's the direct mentorship and indirect mentorship. So this is the other part of mentorship, right? A direct mentorship, like you want to create a channel with like-minded friends and then reach out to other experienced colleagues. The grad program can be very overwhelming. You may fall out of, fall, you, you, you may want to take a lot of things, right? So, but you have to create a channel with like many friends. Have a call, friends of people that share the same goal and ambition with you. And at, at, at so doing, you, you guys will motivate yourself as you go through the graduate application. I have like four friends that when I was applying, we motivated ourselves every day. Sometimes I may really feel down, oh, I don't want to continue because this particular, I'm not seeing progress. But they, they're, they're always there to, okay, put me up and then encourage me. I kept on going. When they were down, I was there to encourage them. Reach out to other experienced colleagues, those people that you've seen that are already in grad school, make friends with them, tell them that you want them to guide you in mentorship. And for indirect mentorship, they have a lot of academic platforms, social media, LinkedIn, and, and academic Twitter. You follow all these people on LinkedIn, academic Twitter, because you have a lot of information there. So yeah, I think I've come to the end of my, of my presentation, just like a little picture gallery of me. I'm working in, in my lab. So this, like, this is the hydrocarbon lab. And yeah, this is after a day of a lot of work I've done. You can see my hair was almost scattered because I was kind of very tired. And yeah, I just said I should put some pictures so you can see. And this, like I said, it's already winter here. It's already snowy. And just like a picture of me and my friends in, in the cold, snowy weather. And thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Emmanuel Obasi. That was an amazing section. So much information, so, so much information. Um, we've gone through a whole lot, how to package your statement of purpose in such a way that you have to get what you want. Um, I, I like the fact when you said, um, send at least 50 code emails. So you see, it's not like, oh, I, I shoot my one shot, I didn't get it, oh, I'm not good enough. No, you do it over and over, and like there's need for consistency. So we'll be moving on straight into the question and answer section. Um, so we have having questions for both speakers. So for our first question to Miss, to Miss, can I get a Miss or Mrs. Um, Oluwa Pumile, so can someone get assistantship position for a course different from their undergraduate degree? Uh, all right, yeah, you, you can. Um, the, the first thing is to be able to tailor, I think Emmanuel mentioned about SOP. You should be able to tailor your, um, your undergrad program to what you're going to do. Um, to your postgrad program. You should be able to say, okay, I have this experience and I want to bring it into my postgraduate program. So basically, you can, uh, you can have your postgraduate program anywhere as long as you can show that you're fit for that program, you have enough experiences or skills to be able to um, take up that program. Yeah. Okay. So I believe that should have answered that question. So said um can an undergraduate student who is graduating in one year time apply for assistantship or research um Emmanuel please answer that question if you are if you're graduating in one year time if you can apply for assistance it depends on when you are, when you're graduating or any timeline so but I'm not gonna advise you if you still have like one year um, no professor would want to wait for you for that time except you have like a very good relationship with him or her but one year is a very long time. So I, I don't really think so, but you should start applying probably towards the end of the program, maybe some months, you'll be graduating in a few months. So I think that's like the very best time you'd want to start and preparing your application and all that. And also considering the fact that you may want to do your NYC service in Nigeria. So it may not really be the best time, but if you have other plans and ambitions, so I mean, towards the end of your graduate program, your undergraduate program, like a month or two, I think that's the best time you should be reaching out to, be, to professors. Okay, thank you. So my discussion goes to you said, um, I observed that you have PhDs from mechanical and electrical engineering programs. How were you able to manage with the mental stress involved? <laughs> All right, um, I think I, 
I talked about my a part of my story. I wasn't planning um when I got to grad school, I wasn't planning to um get a degree in electrical engineering, but um due to funding, I got that opportunity and I went for it. Yeah, I was tasking, um, but um especially with classes that I had to take. Um, electrical engineering had been something I did in, I took some few courses in undergrad. So it was it was challenging. And my dissertation was majorly in the electrical engineering field. So basically it was me trying to balance my time and yeah, balancing my time and just knowing that I wanted to do this. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. So I said, and when you, when, what would you advise someone who has more of leadership experience and volunteering? Emmanuel? I mean, if you have leadership and volunteering, it's a very, very good thing. So it's, it boosts your resume, your academic resume. And it's also something those, this graduate admissions committee, they look out for. They want to see that you have, you can work with people. They want to see that, okay, you are a very good team player. You've had um, leadership experience. You can coordinate people and you have followers and all that. So it's a very good thing. So please, if you have the leadership experience, volunteering, volunteering is very important. It boosts your CV. It's something that you want to include in your in your resume and also also talk about it in your SOP. There's a brief part we talk about it in your SOP. I also do I also did that. I had a lot of leadership experience while in um, in school on my undergraduate school. And in, yes, it's something that I included in my SOP and also in my resume. Okay. So thank you. So my, I'll be asking you a question that is two in one. He said, some professors do not have a list of their graduate students past and present. How do I find these past graduate students? And graduate assistance positions, are they only gotten from lecturers? All right. Um, so I think I mentioned about looking at publications from professors. So when you look at, when you research a particular professor, you look at those who have collaborated with him. Most times, um, those are his research students. So if you look at um, a professor, usually you have your professors as the last author. The first, second, third authors are always his, um, his research students. So you can write to those ones, reach out to them, either on LinkedIn or Google Scholar. Yeah. And the second question was about, um, sorry, did I get the second question? Assistantships, is he only gotten from, um, from lecturers? Uh, for graduate assistantship, I think we talked about three different types of graduate assistantship. You have the teaching assistant, the research assistant, and the administrative assistant. So for my school, the teaching assistant and administrative assistants are majorly coordinated by the department or the grad college. And for the research assistant, it's mostly from the professors because they are the ones who own the phones. And yeah, so they, they sponsor that. Okay. So thank you. Um, Emmanuel, this question is going to you. So for someone who really wants to go into lecturing, how do you set that in your career goal without making it look general? Okay, so if you want to go into lecturing, it's a good thing, right? So well, you you want you want to tell the graduate admissions committee that this particular this particular um, um, program would structure you in such a way that you'd be very, very good, right? You to improve your technical skills and your proficiency, your expertise in this particular knowledge. And then you want to bring it back home to Nigeria because in Nigeria, the, there's like a gap that you want to fill in this particular field. And you believe that your graduate studies must have given you this expertise and you want to come back to Nigeria and then teach um, prospective and um, prospective students and students in, its, in in this particular field. So there's a lot of way you can structure it so that it gives them the idea that you're not just going to teach. There's a particular problem you want to solve with teaching because in Nigeria there's a gap in this particular field in this particular area, and we require expertise learning from these professors here. You can bring that knowledge down home into Nigeria, and then you also. Um, teach younger colleagues and students. I mean, it makes it very different. Okay, thank you so much. I believe that's answered your question. So I'll be taking just two questions and after which every other question will be forwarded to the speakers and you can get the answers from our social media pages. 
So for my last two questions, the first question I'll be taking is, for the graduate assistantship organized by department, so are we allowed to research or message the department directly, you understand, if they have, if, if we don't see the vacancy or opportunities on the website? Ma'am, please, can you take a question? Yes. Um, so for, um, for most schools, um, you are automatically considered for um, assistantship. Some other schools will ask you to make a different application for assistantship. So for, for my school taking, for instance, I was automatically considered for teaching assistant. And like Emmanuel said, I think it was because of my application. I had my test of English exam. I had my GRE submitted, my SOP was there. So you want to um, put in all the necessary documents for your application. So be sure you had your um, test of English because that's the major thing they look out for when you're being considered for graduate teaching assistant. For the um, GAA, which is administrative assistant, some colleges publish theirs, which would be open for you to apply. So that, that, that's what I know, yeah. Okay, so yes, thank you very much, Ma. You wanna please answer this question, though, um, after this question, I'll take one more question due to the consistency of the person asking the question. I feel the person really wants an answer to this question. So, but that'll be the last question. Um, but before then, let's take this question. I said, please, are there chances for someone without a published work or proficiency, um, English proficiency test score? If, if there are chances, I mean, there are always chances, right? There's nothing that is that is zero percent, right? But your chances are very would be limited. So you don't want to place yourself in that that um, limitation. So, but there are some exceptional cases, right? And these exceptional cases are due to sorry, due to a lot of factors. Like last year, there was the COVID nineteen pandemic, right? A lot of schools waived um, GRE and English proficiency tests. I can't even give you. There's a particular friend of mine. He did not write GRE. He did not write any English proficiency tests. But then he got he got he got. Um, his application was strong and then he got um, admission and also funding, right? So, but that was because of, okay, because of the pandemic, a lot of schools waived those things, but now the pandemic is kind of waving out, right? And they would not really give you that grace not to submit English proficiency and all that. Even if they, they may state it on their website, maybe they are waiving those test scores. But please and please make sure you write the English proficiency test scores and, and also your Gary record exam because it gives you, it makes you, it takes you a step higher than every other person that is applying. So please, if there are chances, they are very limited, very, very small, but you don't want to put yourself in that shoe where you have very limited chance. You want to put yourself at that particular point where you're at top of your game, right? So I advise you to write the exams. Thanks. Okay, Ma. so please, um, um, can you give an advice to this person? The person says, my undergraduate research is on nutritional biochemistry. And honestly, I want to go for biotechnology or genomic, genomic, um, or genomic for my MSc. Any advice? Yeah, sure. Um, I I would talk about that, but I quickly want to want to say something about that publication issues. Um, with publication, um, everyone does produce it. This is um, a final year project in um, in Nigerian University. So even if it's not published, it's something you can send over email to your professor and say, okay, this was what I did. I did not have a publication when I was gonna to apply to grad school, but I had worked in companies, I had written technical reports. Um, so I, I, I gave them my technical reports. They weren't published, but I sent some of my technical reports to some of the, um, the potential advisors I was looking at and told them, okay, I, I can write even if it's not published. So you, you, it doesn't have to be published, just show them, okay, I can write something. Uh, tell them about, even if it's an article you've published online, I, I mean, you've written online that is not published, you, it's something you, you can show to them. It doesn't have to be a research paper or a conference paper. You just want to show that you have good command of English, you understand technique, how to present technical details. Okay, so now to the question of um, someone trying to do something totally different from their undergrad. Uh, like I said earlier on, it's just you being able to tell them I can do this that I am. I I I I um I can act, I actually fit into this. 
And I don't think your undergrad program is diff far, far from um, your MSc. Okay, so on, your undergrad is biochemistry, if I get it right. And the other one is genomics. I still feel like they are still under the same life sciences. And so they are not far, apart, far away from, they are not far apart. So the, the classes you've taken in undergrad, you might have taken a class on under genomics that, sh that would appear in your transcript. And that's another thing. They would ask for your transcript at, um, at, at your application. And it's o not only to look at your CGPA, that's not the only reason, but also they wanna look at the classes you've taken. They wanna look at the courses you've taken if it actually matches with what uh, it's obtainable here in the US. So if you have taken classes in, your, in the field that you're aspiring to apply for, then you should be fine. And your SOP is also would 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 sell you if you can tell them, okay, this is the reason why I'm I, I want to study this. This is the plans I have. These are my my career aspirations. Then you should be fine. Yeah. So I I have a friend who studied at Unilag. She she had an undergrad in material science and engineering, and when she was gonna come to the US, she wanted um she had a program was a biz admin like in, well you say it's an mba but she had to take um financial classes i think she came in for masters of finance initially then she added an mba but those are two two different um i would like two different programs that like they're far away from each other so it's you being able to sell yourself you should be able i'm not saying you should lie um, but you should be able to say, okay, this is what I have done, and I think I can transfer this into this. So we would usually talk about transferable skills in the US. So this is the part I've worked. If you can tell them, this is the part I've worked. I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry, and I think I can transfer it into genomics. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, basically, based on that question, um, the person that asked the question said, okay, the issue I'm having is research experience that I'm lacking in biotechnology. So I think um, you, the major idea is for you to be able to sell yourself. So even if you don't have the required research ex, um, experience, you can maybe you can take up short courses, I think so. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so for, for research experience, um, if you're really interested in things like this, you research experience um okay i know some fields are really really specific but i know um with volunteering or with internships um you can you can gain enough experiences even before coming for your phd you can volunteer in um in industries that you think if you don't have a full-time job that you can volunteer and say okay i just want to learn this experience or i just want to gather these skills um to be able to make an application and then it should go on your resume. Your on-page job can go on your resume. Yeah. So that should not deter you. If you find the right um, advisor who is um, willing to give you, who is willing to um, take the chance on you, then you should be fine. Who is willing to give you the opportunity, then you should be fine. Okay, so thank you so much, Ma. Uh, there's a question I really want us want, want Emmanuel to answer. Um, I don't know if this applies to US to US, but I know it's very common in, in UK. It said um, some fully funded scholarship will say after your MSc program, um, he or she should need to return to her um, his or her country. So my question is, how can one stay back after MSc program if he or she decides to stay back? Okay, I, I think I would answer, but I think my the first speaker would also have a very good experience on that because she, she's already working. And so in the US here, there's something they call OPT, right? And CPT, right? So it gives you the leverage to work after you've completed your program, it gives you the leverage to work for like a year, two or, or thereabouts, if I'm not mistaken, for you to work. So, and these are the periods. So if you want to stay in the US, right? When you come here, I don't know your mindset, but uh, some people would want to work here. They don't. They don't just want to come here for for just to, to study. They also want to transition into the work, the, the working industry. So it's a very good thing that before the end of the program, you start looking out for if you're doing an MSc, 
he said looking out for summer internship for after summer internship because summer internship will give you the opportunity where you would work with the company and when the thing is if you've secured a job with that company it's very easy for you to transition after your school um i mean some schools may be some companies may be willing to file for your yeah this, they call it work permits visa and all that right so yes it's very possible that after your msc or your phd you want to stay back so but you have to be very strategic you have to start working towards that even when you are still in school so that at the end of the day once you are you, once once you are done i mean the company is giving you a job and you started working and in some cases the company may help file for your your work permit or, or, or maybe green green card or thereabouts right in some cases, the company may not be willing to do that, but if the company is taking it as, as taking you, it gives you a leverage, gives you an edge to fight for those and fight for the, for that visa, and you'll be able to get a visa. When you get a visa, I mean, you you'll be working in the US, and I think the first speaker will be very very much interested to answer this question because I mean she's already working. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for passing that to me, Emmanuel. Yeah. Um. So Emmanuel was right about what he said. Um, when you come to the US, um, one thing I would say is be prepared to work. Like we are Africans and we always have this hustling spirit in us. So when you come to the US, don't think, oh, I have arrived and you now come and sit down. No, <laughs> it's time to work. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying it is the hustling continues when you come to the US, because even if you look at it, you are not the only African coming in. And so aside the fact that um, you have to do well in grad school, outside of grad school, there's the fact that you have to also get a job and also um, get um, your immigration papers. So what I usually um, tell people is put your best, um, put in your best when you're in grad school. In my three years of being in grad school, I was able to publish 10 papers. And that was because I really knew what I wanted. To. My first year was rough. So I published those, three, those 10 papers in two years. The reason why I'm speaking about publication is even when you do not go through the, the normal route of immigration, your publication, your research experience, you can actually use that to file for your immigration papers in the US. I don't know what obtains for them in the UK. It's a different, it's a totally different ball game in the UK because I know they now allow extended stay after grad school. But the, for the US, like Emmanuel said, if you're in a STEM program, the maximum number of years you have is three years. The first year is your OPT for everyone. Everyone who comes to study, you have your OPT, that's for one year, which is you can, you're allowed to work for that one year. And for those in the STEM related field, you have two extra years, which is three, three years in total, for which within those three years, you have to um, get your immigration papers. And it's either your company files for you or you file for yourself. So the reason why I mentioned publication is because the, the population is like, we have a lot of Africans actually fighting for this limited number of slots that we have for immigration. Um, it's even more difficult for, for people like um, from, for, for um, the Indians and the Chinese. So it's, it's, it's usually best when you have publication, there's this thing with, that is called the NIW, which is the National Interest Waiver. And that is you showing that, oh, you have been able to contribute to the US in terms of research, in terms of science and technology. And that's through your publications. And by that, you can actually get a permanent resident. And with time, you can get your US citizenship. Like Emmanuel also said, internships is very key. I got an internship in my first year with GE Global Research. And that, um, I mean, my current employer, I work with Intel Corporation. My current employer would have also seen that I had been able to work um, successfully in um in the american um in the american industry of course i had worked in nigeria i had, had other international experiences but they want they want to also know that you can work in the american culture because it's it, it's it's different from where we are coming from and so internship helps you get that internships um volunteering um yeah 
they all help you get that. Um, even part-time jobs, co-ops. So when you come into, into grad school, be sure to, these are things you also need to talk about with your advisor. Would you need to ask your advisor, would you allow me go for at least an internship? Would you allow me go for an, a co-op? And discuss with them um, about publication. Would you allow me, because there are some grad students that would never get to um, publish their research. And this is because they have non-disclosure agreements on their research. So you need to ask your advisor, you know, <laughs> as um, Nigeria, you, you plan ahead. If you know what you want, you need to start planning ahead. You need to ask your advisor, would you allow me to publish my research? Am I allowed to be the first author? Am I, is my name allowed to appear? You know, those are questions you ask your advisor when you finally get one. And so when, yeah, so publications, internships go up and, yeah, those those go a long way. And yeah, then career fair. Yeah, be sure to attend career fair. I think Emmanuel mentioned that your school, your school would organize career fairs. You have a lot of companies coming in to recruit students, even if you're not ready to, to apply for a job, just attend those career fairs because <laughs> You will meet people, you will be able to network with people like insiders in the company and you have connection, like you build connections with them. You, you are able to, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm an Osler and I would, <laughs> I'm never in denial of that. When I go to career affairs, you see me with my, <laughs> you see me with my paper, my bio, like I'm taking people's name. And as soon as I'm done from that career affair, I'm going to LinkedIn <laughs> to connect with them. I'm sending them an email, even if I don't need a job yet. I'm sending them an email. Oh, we met and we talked about this. Can you um, connect me with people and things like that? And let me mention finally that um, LinkedIn is a very good place to connect with people. I've met recruiters on LinkedIn. Um, I've had people reach out to me on LinkedIn asking me if I want a job. Like these are top companies like recruiters. So update your LinkedIn profile, even your Twitter accounts. Make sure you're following these, um, these professors. Follow these companies like they publish they post um, adverts on, on this, their social media accounts and all of those. So follow them. LinkedIn, um, pimp your LinkedIn account. Like, advertise yourself. Don't lie. But be sure to advertise yourself on LinkedIn because you have recruiters reaching out to you, to you over there. And I also wanted to say something. You have also professors um, advertising their research, their, research, um, their research group. Like... I've seen that lately since COVID. You see a lot of professors coming to say, oh, I'm looking for students to resume in this semester to conduct this research. So if you are active on LinkedIn, that would be a good place to meet professors, to meet recruiters from companies. And I finally want to say something. Um, I, I usually tell people my story that I'm a girl that has been helped by God. And so I would not leave out that part in this webinar. Uh, so there's there's a place for grace there's the god factor in everything whatever you believe in don't always leave god out outside of it um trust god that you always find favor yeah so thank you wow this this has been a very very amazing section so thank you so much um Oluwa Pumile. thank you emmanuel obasi it's 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 really wonderful having the two of you here we cannot really take all the questions because um, of time factor. So if you have more questions, you can reach out to study globally in Nigeria through our various social media platforms where we can attend to your questions for you and then help you connect with the speakers to get answers to the various questions that you want. So um, we'll be going straight to the photo session which will be anchored by Uchenna. All right, thank you, Queen. What's what the section it has been? So, um, everyone at um, at this point, we would love to take um a photo section for our record purposes. So, we want you to just turn on your camera so we can see your beautiful and handsome faces, and then uh, we we'll take um photo and picture from the back end here. We need this for record for record purposes. So, it will just take a minute. So everyone, please um, turn on your camera. Let's see your beautiful and handsome faces, please.
Is Mr. Onyeka confirmed you are taking the pictures? You need to stop sharing your screen. Okay, are we good to go now? Not yet. Okay. Some people's camera is still awful. Ah, you don't want us to see your handsome and beautiful faces. So, Mr. Simeon, please confirm we are good. Uh, some seconds. Okay. <laughs> Someone said no light in Nigeria. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are good. All right, all right. Thank you, everyone. You can turn off your camera now if you wish to. Um, so, Queen, take it away from here. Um, real quick, if I could just say something, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, sorry, I'm a very busy person. I'm trying to set so in. It's a new job for me, so I'm understanding so many things. I just got into my job in um. July. I started my job in July. So it's a learning first for me, but I will be happy to talk to anyone um, over LinkedIn and Twitter. And I think Emmanuel will be happy to do that too. So you can, <laughs> you can send me a chat um, if you need any help with anything. And yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Nice yeah, sure. Same here too. Nice one from our speakers. Like, we really appreciate that. So you see, we, we, bring, we bring you full package. So um, we'll be going straight to the announcement from our collaborators, that's the Society of Shalom Engineers Potakot section. Simeon, please, can you have that for us? Marianne, please. Marianne. Um, is she a co-host? Yes, she is. Mariana, your co-host, please unmute yourself. Simeon, please, can you unmute her? I think she can actually unmute herself. It's not working. She She's a co -host. Okay, in order not to waste time, let me just go through the slide. Good evening, everyone. Um, this uh, Society of Petroleum Engineer, SP, Potakot session. So here yeah, is just to encourage everyone, can, just as you have heard from our various speaker, there are a lot you need to volunteer and also partake in several activities. These are part of what you share as a student anywhere you want to tender your application. So SP is a place for all of today's oil and gas energy industry, professional and also student, regardless of your experience or course of study. So anyone who can be a member, student can be a member, recent graduates, young professionals, senior members. So, on the right hand side, you can see the these are but few, several benefits, <coughs> excuse me, 
several benefits you can get for being a member of SP. You have a strong industrial network of leaders, peers and mentors, and also live technical events and enhance industry knowledge and so on and so on. So there are several benefits you can get for being a member of SP. So if you want to be a member or you want to renew for student, it is free. You just visit your student chapter, any of the school, and or you can connect with us. Type SP Portacot session <clears throat> in any of the social media platform. You can get us there, or you can easily send us an email, sppec at gmail.com. We'll connect with you. Please, the next slide. So about odds, SP Portacot session. Yeah, we are the second largest in Nigeria with a coverage of six states and also 13 students chapter with a membership strength of, you can see the figures and it's growing day by day. And for professionals, you want to be a member, you can see the registration amount and also for renewal is there for students, just as I made mention earlier, it is free. So you just visit your student chapter or visit the link you'll see there, just type it on any of the browser and we'll communicate with you or send an email to sppsc at gmail.com and we'll connect with you. Please, the next slide. So for further inquiry or more clarification on on um, SP here in Port Harcourt session, you can visit, just as I made mention, those are the email address you can reach us with. And the next person you are seeing there is a membership share. You can also reach in on this email and also the assistant membership share. You can also reach out on that email. So these are membership team that you can reach out to for any clarification you need. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Simeon. We'll be having our vote of thanks from Nse. Nse, please, can we have the vote of thanks? I'll be standing in for her. She has issues with her network, so if you can hear me. I want to thank you all, our colleagues at Study Global in Nigeria and our event organizer at Society of Petroleum Engineers, Podako Session SP, Podako Session 103, for your dedication and time over the past one hour. Ah, my sincere gratitude goes to our speakers for connecting with us from miles away. We appreciate you immensely. They spoke on two things, on things to consider while applying for postgraduate school funding, that's vis-a-vis -vis funding in grad school, as well as the importance of recommendation letters. Our last speaker emphasized the importance of the statement of purpose, and I want to use this opportunity to remind us that at Massive Global Limited, we are poised to do it is affordable. You can follow us on all our social media spaces. You can follow us uh, at Marcy Global Nigeria for more information. And I do hope you have learned as much as I did. And uh, this and this will serve as a guide to students who intend to do their PhD in autumn 2022. <coughs> follow me. Finally, to everyone here present, this webinar is a success because of your efforts and participation. Thank you very much and see you again in our November edition. God bless you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Akachi. Um, let's have your closing <coughs> remark. Okay, in the same vein, I want to especially appreciate every one of us that's one time to attend and to wait this long. I sincerely apologize for making this a very, very long webinar, but we must have to say that at this point, we really enjoyed the session we had with our two speakers. So pardon our nuances for keeping you this long. 
And I'm sure that we are going back home better refreshed, better informed. And we have the tools that are requisite that are important for us to be able to ace our applications and gain admission into the various schools of our interest. So we look forward to seeing you again in the next edition. I want to say thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. So we've come to the end of today's webinar. Please remember that this program was brought to you by Study Global in Nigeria, your pathway to success. We engage in admission processes for people who want to study abroad. We also have a premium platform where we provide information on available scholarships, both in US, Canada, UK, and even other countries. So you can reach out to us via our different social media platforms. We are on LinkedIn by our name, Study Globally Nigeria. Please do well to check us out. And you can also check out the, this program, the recording of, of it on our YouTube page. Please check out Study Global Nigeria on YouTube to get the records of this webinar. So let's have a closing prayer from one of our volunteers. Uh, do you mean anyone? Yes, anybody. Okay, I can do that. Um, dear Lord, we just want to say thank you for this time and thank you for bringing us together. Uh, thank you for everything we've learned and thank you for as many that have the intention of pursuing graduate studies. Father, uh, you've shown Emmanuel and I grace. And today we extend this grace to the ones. We ask, Father, you cause them to find favor also in Jesus' name. We bless you, Father, for answered prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.